viewpoint or, or a freedom viewpoint, there are uh, arguments one could make that uh, they're giving too much. Uh, but but I, you know, it, it's very tough to imagine that you can have a system where we don't, you, you want security, you want to know who's there, you want uh, to, to provide services to people and services to go to the right people. So if you don't have a way to know whether the services are going to the right people, it's going to be very tough to do it. You know, I, I told yesterday also that uh, many of us and many of you, actually, the new generation of people, the people uh, who are so connected to, to the internet now that you have geo and you can do as much uh, 4G or 5G as you want, you're willing to give your information to anybody. You know, anytime you download some app or something, they ask you to agree to the terms and conditions. You don't even read it. I don't read it. Is there anybody who reads it? Do you know what you're signing away? We don't care, right? We don't. But somehow we get very hyped up when we feel, oh my God, government has this information. Think about the private organizations, the Googles of the world, how much information they have about you. Where you stop, what you ate. Of course, Facebook knows what you ate because you always post what you ate. <laughs> Who you are with. So, I mean, the, the, the whole concept of this, uh, this privacy and security is, is really uh, 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 going to be for debate for a long time. For us. And uh, I think uh, as society matures, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have better uh, ways to secure things. But also there would be a lot more responsibility. We don't probably need as much uh, information from, from people. So, so it's a good question, but that's really uh, something that I'm sure. How many of you really care about the, the privacy information that you're giving to your iPhone or your cell phone? You care? I mean, how many people? When you use your camera and, and your mobile phone, does it come in your mind what information somebody might be collecting on you? Ever? Anybody? Yes? Raise a hand, yes? Hey, nobody. Nobody cares. <laughs> Which is bad. <laughs> We, we, but, but I think uh, uh, that's, the, that's the societal issue that we always have to care. And I think it's important to have the checks and balances. But then right now I think it's important to, to have a better governance and less corruption. And that's really important. So I think there would be sacrifices. You can't really have both ways as they say. Right? Any, any other question? So let's see, uh, uh, so we talked about, uh, you know, sort of uh, how do we do uh, the, uh, the solar panel, efficient solar panels and so on, right? So we have research going on where uh, a professor and his team is looking at uh, uh, very effective light absorbing photo detectors. The, the point is that can you really come up with the materials and they can absorb the energy and they can sustain it for a longer time so it's cheaper for us to really use the, uh, the, the solar, solar energy. So that's really important and we have a team of people working on that. So they are trying to address that, that issue. On, on the, uh, in terms of the uh, virtual reality and how you can make use of the virtual reality, it's a very interesting project where in the School of Education, Graduate School of Education, they're using the virtual reality for, for, for really uh, uh, learning purposes. So they're looking at uh, uh, the behavior, uh, in, you know, give, providing you scenarios and looking at the brain behavior to think about how you learn, how you react to things, and, and using the virtual reality. And, and then once we know how the minds learn and how they, they react to new information, we might be able to provide better information, information in better ways and, and this, this would be useful. I don't know how useful it would be, but this actually is in the right direction. So, so this is the other project that, uh, that, that's going on. 
So how do we build the uh, uh, network of, mul ne the, the building the brain network with, at multiple scales? So by connecting the node, which is known as structural network, I, or by connecting in a statistical way, not necessarily they are connected, but with a statistical way they are connected to each other, each of the nodes. And you allow to look at the brain graph, and then you try to look at the differences between different models, and also you try to look at the differences with the actual models, what goes on. So again, trying to understand the behavior of the brain, can we use this to reverse engineer the brain? That's the goal, right? And can we do this kind of research and then think about how the brain works? And then we are able to maybe create an AI product that would be thinking like human beings. So that's really another research going on. Now, how this is a very interesting example. This is a professor in uh, exercise and nutrition science. Uh, she's working on uh, uh, there's a signal that's called the uh, MLN signal in the brain that understands. Uh, sort of a better reward system. So she identified the ventral uh, segmental area in the side of the brain at which uh, this uh, uh, animal, emelin, controls the energy balance. So the idea really is that uh, if you can control the brain signal, it can say that you're full. You don't have to finish the whole chip. You know, for us really, how do we control the brain? The people have reward systems, so can we give reward system inside the brain? So it says, okay, I'm done with the chips now, although we love chips, we want to eat more, but it can tell you that we, you don't need to. So, so this is important because obesity is a, a major issue in US. People just having soda and chips quite a bit, and going to McDonald's when they can. So this really, the question is, once they start eating it, we have no control and can we really work in the brain signal and fool them in terms of rewards so they feel that they are really full, they don't need to eat anymore. And that's the that sort of research that's going on. This is very interesting actually where, uh, you know, when, when we have uh, new vaccines, when we have vaccines, we usually try to kill all the uh, sort of uh, harmful bacteria, right? I mean, the, idea is just kill them and you'll be fine. As I said earlier, some of the bacteria actually is useful and you don't want to kill them. So can you come up with a vaccine that only attacks the harmful bacteria and only attacks when it is going to harm you as opposed to just killing it. And right now we have a brute force approach. You get a vaccine, it kills things and Killing it means also that it kills uh, some of the good stuff. And uh, that's the biome stuff that I was talking about before. Can we come up with the vaccine that says, okay, we understand these are the bad guys, they're behaving badly, and we kill them. Almost like the cancer medicine actually. Cells that are not behaving and not kill the other cells. This is really, uh, uh, I think about the, uh, the impact that we'll have and the life is going to is going is it's going to uh, to uh, to save. Uh, similarly, you know, there's uh, uh, work going on that uh, uh, can be re really uh, uh, treat the cancer with some level of uh, uh, similar uh, to the killing the bacteria where we work at the uh, the, the, uh, uh, at, at the uh, uh, level of uh, peptides and, 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 and cure the cancer. Same kind of work. This is a center that is a fairly large center supported by National Science Foundation. And uh, this uses lasers. And again, the biologists and, uh, and the, the uh, engineers are working to see if we can create new medical devices and medical uh, procedures to improve the quality of life. So again, this kind of research. Uh, the, the other one is really uh, uh, a, a new project that's going on in terms of uh, can we target the cancer cells, kind of like a bomb approach, just kill the cells that are in bad shape. 
is also a balloon approach where actually you, you have nanoparticles. They work like balloons. And nanoparticles particles are targeted to get to the cells that have cancer. A lot of work going on in cancer because we cannot kill it. That's so far, it's very hard to do it. A lot of exciting work. A lot of work that involves uh, technology, involves uh, even uh, flow dynamics, uh, involves uh, uh, some level of computation. A lot of computation needs to be done. You need to understand the, the, the body structure. You need to understand the thickness of your muscles. How, that, how do you target the cells to go exactly at the place that you want to reach so that it does not sell you know, the, the nanoparticles of the balloon that you're sending so it does not really affect the other parts of the body. So that's really that's really important as well, and and, and involves uh, uh, collaboration between multiple fields. What what you'll find that in many of these, it's no longer that you really work in one discipline. And I tried to emphasize that yesterday. So that you should think about really. Even if you go and work in an IT company as IT graduate, the projects that you work will be working on, and, and your you have to have an understanding of those projects. It's not just coding. The better understanding of multiple disciplines you have, the better it is for you. The better advancement you're going to have, because a company might be working on one of these uh, developing software for one of these uh, projects, and the people who control the knowledge base are going to be controlling the project. So if you know a little bit more beyond your coding, you would do much better. Of course, coding would also be do better. You will do better, but if you know a little more, it would be good. Of course, the, uh, the big data aspect, uh, which, which uh, really is uh, all over the place, uh, the, the, the collecting data every second, every microsecond on everything. The question is how do you use it? How do you analyze the big data and how to use it? That's really something. We have projects in almost every area here in terms of the big data. And uh, the other aspect really is infrastructure. So we, uh, one of our alumni just gave us a bunch of money to look at sustainable transportation logistics. You know, we could continue to do the trucking and uh, pollute the environment. We could continue to build infrastructure. I'm losing at least three people now to sleep. I can only ask the three people who are going to sleep. Please wake up. <laughs> uh, so you can continue to, to improve the, uh, continue to do how we do business, but we can actually work on the environment. How do we create, this is by the way, the, the picture of city of Buffalo, but the part of the city of Buffalo, but the, how do we improve the, the quality of the infrastructure so that we have a better life? Uh, this is important. How do we uh, fighting cyber crime with your smartphone? So, a, a computer science faculty is using uh, uh, sort of using the smartphone instead of body parts as a form of identification to deter crime, cyber crime. The, his team thinks that the pattern of microscoping imaging is totally different in every cell phone. And there are no two cell phones that would have the same thing. It's almost like DNA, which is you and your cell phone. And based on that, they can detect crime. They, they can do cyber security. This is a, they, they, they had a pub, paper published uh, only this year. So this sort of gives a chance not to really worry about people's fingers. You know, how do you think who is this? You know, you have fingerprints in a, with your cell phone, and picture in your cell phone, they can recognize you. It sounds uh, fascinating, sounds counterintuitive, but as they say, if every picture taken in there has a flaw and that presents a pattern and that's unique to your phone. So I don't need to really have your fingerprints in. You claim that's your phone, we can trace you or we can identify you. Now also, uh, same guy has done some work, which is uh, how do you really uh, uh, with your wires, you know, how people hack and how can you figure out that somebody's hacking or not hacking. So again, he's got this identification 
And this one actually has gotten a lot of press. People actually want to, uh, to, to, to use it. They are also using uh, the, the biometrics and going into the heart security. Heart is being used for your security. Every heart has a different beat, and we can identify you. You don't need to really uh, take any of your uh, fingerprints or iris or anything. You just come in and many of these have issues. You know, as people have heart attack, probably you can't identify them. Their beats are different. <laughs> but the, the question really is that there's a lot more we can do that people don't have to go through extra level of uh, security and so on. And we can solve the crimes and we can do other things with it as well. This is an important issue, how do we get uh, safe drinking water? So, so the question here is really, uh, the, the water is available, there's technology, of course, to purify water, and it's usually uh, reverse osmosis people use to purify water. It's a little expensive. So people at, uh, at the university in, in our chemical and biological engineering and our uh, chemistry are looking at nanostructure materials to use as filters so they can actually uh, uh, take some of the salt away and, and process the water in a very reduced energy consumption way. Because if you do reverse osmosis, it consumes energy. And you don't want to use that much, as much energy. So how do you can improve the quality? You know, the, the, the goal really is that we should be able to get pure water by just using some very, very inexpensive way and very, very quickly. Of course, the ultimate goal is we should not get the polluted water to begin with, but that's polluted. So how do we get to pure water without going through a very elaborate and long process, an expensive process? And this is really one of the grand challenges everywhere, not just the one I talked about, but this water is so critical in, in, in terms of what we do. Uh, we all use drones. Actually, the other day during the uh, festivity, we had drones taking pictures. But uh, drones could also be used. One of our professors, uh, he's using drones to uh, uh, quickly and efficiently map, <coughs> map out the oil spills. You know, when oil spills happen at a very remote area, you can take pictures, but that's not going to give you all the information you need. How can you really use that capability to get the images in a way that you can quantify the amount of damage and kind of damage that's going on? And, and when drone gives you this access to places where you don't have access. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like sending robots to, to, to sort of uh, defuse the bomb. You can send the ro robot, you can send the drone to figure out the dangerous thing that's going on before you take action, before you put human life in danger. So this is again, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a sort of a, Something uh, that, that has, uh, again, people are looking at that, and there's always bad things happening all over. So research threats include space analytics for emerging threat identification. This is, again, how do you get the data cues and data sources from multiple places. Data fusion actually is, in some way, you have data sources in different formats coming together. And how do you use the data to get the information out of it? The data might be coming through radar, radars. Data might be coming through drones. Data might be coming through human entering the data. And they're all different formats. How do you make sense of the data as you fuse it? Scales might be different. So this is, again, uh, if, if you look at, if, when you do the pro big projects, I can find this, that many of the very complex projects in, in reality have data fusion aspects. So this actually works on, on security issues. Uh, this is the uh, uh, thing that I talked about be before, the uh, how do you uh, uh, sort of uh, take the bad gases and reduce them to not so bad gases for the environment, for health, and so on. How do you really try to diffuse that, that issue of environment? And I talked about uh, advanced personalized learning before. So, so really, 
And the final one really is we can engineer to the tools for scientific story. And this is the one that I'm going to talk about now a little bit more. So I've got about uh, 15, 20 minutes, and uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to something slightly different. So how can we accelerate discovery? You know, sort of, uh, in some sense, discovery is hard, and we are making a process out of it. It's almost like oxymoron, but bear with me. Let me show you what I mean by this. So, so this is a project that uh, that we have. So if you look at it, uh, you got data, and those are numbers and symbols. We try to get information out of that, and that's processing the data, basically says who, what, and when, gives you that. From the information, hopefully, you can create some knowledge. Make sense? From that, if you got some knowledge, hopefully, you can analyze it, get some meanings out of it, and that probably is your understanding, what, it, what word knowledge there is. And from there, you can get the wisdom in, ter in terms of creativity and what, whatever you want to do. So, so if you look at it, you know, what, how, and why. So you got the data available, which is what. Gives you knowledge how things happen. And then you got the why part, understanding, and then of course you get the best information that's there. And on the other side, you're really trying to find out the relations, the patterns, and the principles. Right? You got large amount of data. You're trying to understand the data. You go through multiple of these phases. Does this make sense? Is everybody okay with this? Good. So if you think about the uh, how much there is information? How, do, how much do we know? The first journal article was published in 1665. And now we have paper published, multiple paper published every second actually. So, so this is really something that uh, uh, the, the amount of information that's coming out now is tremendous. I mean, you've got millions of papers coming out every year in every field. In addition, you've got blogs that gives you information. You've got pictures that give you information, lots of information. As a student, if you want to research in an area, you're totally confused what to look, what to believe, what not to believe. So what's the big data? What do we mean by big data, actually? When people define big data, they actually have four Vs. So they say the variety of the data, so multiple types of data coming in, that's big data. Velocity at which the data is coming high velocity data coming in, the amount of data that's coming in, the volume, and the, the veracity of the data. That means we really don't know whether the data is right or not. There are some information that you may not be sure about. So the definition of big data when people talk about big data is this. So if you look at the uh, uh, data coming in, in terms of the uh, research papers, there are papers coming from many different forms, you know, in, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, unstructured structures, pictures. Data is always in motion coming in. We have volumes of data, and we have data in doubt. A lot of you can't trust everything you read about a subject on, on the internet. There might be blogs, there might be Google searches that give you some information, and you have no clue. So how do I find out I want to work in an area? How do I get the amount of information that I want and how do, how do I do it quickly? So total publication in 2009 estimate was 50 million articles in that year. 
23 of those were just in biomedical literature. I'm sorry, this is the total article. Just in the bi biomedical sciences that is available, there's a system called PubMed. PubMed has most of the articles in, the, in, in, uh, in biological sciences. There's, of course, the COPUS that has 45 million articles. You got Web of Knowledge that has about 40 million articles in it. Google, of course, uh, unknown and, and not peer reviewed, you got tons of information. So, so if you look at it, really, it satisfies, it says that there's every minute, there's 1.29 articles being published, 700,000 articles per year. Who's have time to read this? Even if you concentrate in your field, that's too many articles. And the rate of growth is actually going about 4 to 8%. It's almost exponential growth, actually. So there's volume there. If you look at the research data available to you, we have volume, we have variety of the data, we have the veracity of the data, we have the velocity of the data, all the V's satisfy. So we know that the research information is big data. We can agree on that, that all the information available for research is big data. So how do we really learn and discover? So we have state of the art, and we try to discover through the information that's available in our journals. We get the information out, we do the knowledge, we understand and wisdom. We go through the process to, to get something new. And it's, it's an iterative process. You sort of publish in here, and then this is state of the art, new is used again to get new information and so on. Read articles, multiple articles, we produce our own articles that becomes part of the big data and then people use that, right? So that's the, uh, so this is really, can we make this process efficient? Is there a way to make the process efficient? How, how can we make the process efficient? So this is one of the grand challenges that I talked about. Advance the process of scientific querying leading to comprehensive learning and accelerated discovery. This is what we want to really look at. So search and retrieval is the access. We need to learn, access, learn, and discover. Those are the three steps that we need to take. So access, of course, is available through digitization. We have almost everything available now. In fact, the libraries have changed. There's no books in the library. We just renovated our some of the libraries, one of them about uh, 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 half a million square foot. You know, it's all chairs and desks and quiet reading room and about 1,200 power points, uh, power plugs, because every student wants one or two power plugs. And a coffee shop in the library. You can have your coffee and you can just study yourself. There's no book in there. All digitized. And Google has. 35 million volumes, Amazon has that. In fact, there's a project in India, NSF, uh, uh, India project that has about a million book that are freely available, they're digitized in India, uh, they're in multiple languages, and there are some palm leaf manuscripts as well. And uh, our institution was involved, Triple IT Allahabad was involved, uh, there are some institutions in the South that were involved, Carnegie Mellon was involved, so there were a lot of really institutions that were involved in, in doing that. So there's a paradigm shift now from the books to the machine. A lot more available, now we have to figure out how to make it quick. So we need to automate this process, we need to extract deep meaning from these papers, summarize them, cluster the response, and so on. So think about a search scenario here. So if you did, uh, there's a show called Breaking Bad, TV show, or you can do Sasvi Kavi Bahuti, <laughs> whatever you like. And it's amazing that information that you get is so organized because when you say Breaking Bad, it's precisely defined. When you say Sasvi Kavi Bahuti, people know exactly and information can be you know, so it can give you information uh, uh, with respect to how good the series is, 
you know, what the scenarios are, how many episodes are available, who the cast is, people who search for this, also search for this. You have all the information you need. It's very well organized. You don't need to worry about, you know, if somebody does more breaking fast, you know, they would be available on that. It's being processed and you have good information. Search scenario two, uh, you know, we live in, uh, uh, this is where uh, the university is, right here. And so, and this is town of Amherst, this is Buffalo here. And so if you search for uh, the queries, the restaurants near Amherst, New York, you would get something like this and you get all the restaurants and you don't have to worry about all the information is very well done. Right, so it's all available to you. You know, there's some ambiguity in this one. If you wanted to search by Jaguar, it doesn't know whether it's the, it's the animal or the car. What is interesting though in this scenario, most of the pictures would be to the animal and most of the links would be to the car. But now you, you're introducing some ambiguity here, but not much. Actually. You still get the Jaguar, all the Jaguars that, that you can get. Now, a re researcher is looking for information to explore handwriting recognition. Totally confused. It's going to give you all the products, links to the products. It's going to give you all kinds of things, but not going to give you really a uh, scientific query, the right kind of information. There's nothing available right now. Available for things that are precisely defined or commercial, but nothing really for researchers to, to work on. So one of the examples we are working on, not me, but researchers at, at Buffalo has a project to, to think about the experimental material physicist interested in discovering new temperature driven metal insulator transition. So a special kind of metal which high temperature has a property, low temperature doesn't have that property. It wants to find out all those that are available. So a scientific paper, how does the scientific paper look like? You'd have the title, you got the abstract, there will be some keywords, there will be introduction, literature, method. By the way, if you're gonna write a research paper, this is the good way to write it. So you'd have these things in a paper. That's how the paper should be. So how do we access this? How do we get the information we want? So you have, you can do keyword based search. You can do it manually. You have to do manually actually to, to get the summary. You have to do this next part, extract the deep meaning from the reduced document and you have to revise the query to reach information. So what you do is you keep the, you do query with the keywords, you revise your query again, manually you get other information, you get to the final uh, paper that you might want. You may never get to the paper that you want, but that's how you go, go about doing it. So, so really, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go fast here. So the approach today really is trial and error iteration method. The problem with these papers is that the papers are written with tables in it. Papers are written with uh, graphs in it. And the query you say that, you know, give me this property of the material <clears throat> between the temperature 200 to 400 degrees. How would the query be answered? Because to do that, you need to read the, the graphs and the tables. So there is expertise now. People are looking at how to classify the papers, how to classify the graphs and the tables so that you can answer those questions. This is all research going on, nothing is really done yet. And so a, a query would be able to give you all the papers that address the issue of that kind of material with that type of property automatically. And then it might give you 20 papers, you can read it and you can say, uh, we can do it or we can't do it. So that would accelerate your, your discovery because a lot of the automation will give you actually the, 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 a limited uh, scope in terms of what you need to study and what's applicable to you. 
So that's the project. Uh, I'm going to stop. I actually give you a few minutes to ask questions, but you know, how do you segment stuff and how do you do things? Uh, so a lot of work there. Very hard to segment those things. Handwritings are also part of that, and and the challenges are plentiful. Sorry, the challenges were quite clear. And you will need the information from all of that. I want to get to my last slide. One of the applications actually is, uh, you know, it's tough to read the uh, doctor's handwriting. How do you? Uh, <laughs> and actually, we have some success on, on doctor's handwriting. People tell us that uh, if your handwriting is good, you can never be a doctor. So if your handwriting is bad, <laughs> all right, we we are done with it. Uh, I'll be happy to answer a question. There's a lot more to go. I didn't expect that I'll go through all of this anyway, but uh, you get the gist of it. So keeping the pace of scientific progress, you need efficient access, thorough research accelerated discoveries, and this would have good impact. The top one is from uh, my alma mater uh, motto. And of course, uh, we need to understand things, otherwise nothing is really there in the knowledge. Knowledge is important.